Hey, Gwen, I'm sort of stage fright, so I don't think I know how to say anything right now. So just oh, on. listen at you, Clarence. This is Fed Talk. These folks have signed on. They want to see something dynamic. And we're talking about the best. Let me tell you the best <laughs> subject called budget. And to me, that's all about money. So I don't know how much more exciting than we can or cannot get. So I need you to get on my website. Come on, let's go, let's go. Let's do it, let's do it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Clarence, back to you. Come on, did I get you going? Yeah, you did. Yeah, <laughs> we're very excited about being able to share some ideas. We're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about uh, budget. We're going to share. You, know, you can get all the books. You can go read all the books about budget. It says, you know, the president does this and Congress does that. And then it comes back and the like. OK, but that's not how it really gets done. So we're going to share with you some of the secrets about how do you actually use this process and get some things done and, and better position yourself in your organization. We're going to do it with fun. We're going to interview each other. We're going to, we got a few slides. We got some videos, uh, but we also are counting on you to ask questions and to uh, push back and to have a real dialogue and have some fun as we talk about it. Um, so Gwen and I have known each other for a number of years. We were on the CFO council together. Um, I was 15 when I encountered Clarence. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm not sure which one of us got the other one in trouble, but we ended up setting it in, in the old days in the CFO council, uh, they had, uh, the room was divided into the good CFOs and the bad CFOs. And somehow I ended up in the bad CFO group. And, um, and so that's what we, that yeah, we had a lot of fun though. <laughs> <laughs> we knew our business. That, that, was, that was the problem was we knew what we, we were supposed to do and we had fun doing it. So we're gonna, we're gonna, today we're gonna talk and we're gonna share the secret sauce. You know, just like when you get ready to cook a meal, uh, you can have all the ingredients on the counter, but if you don't know the, the right uh, order in which to, uh, to add the ingredients, you don't know um, the right proportions to use. If you got the proportions and you got the right ingredients, but you had the wrong uh, uh, oven temperature or you had it in too long or too short, it still didn't turn out well. Well, you're gonna get the secret sauce, the secret ingredients, and how to make this thing cook. So we're gonna have some fun here. The first thing I wanted just to share with you is just a, um, a chart that we use just to level expectations. You know, one of the things that organizations don't do well, whether they are private sector or government, is we don't do a really good job of talking about expectations, what we expect of you. Mm -hmm. When we hired you as a grade nine, what made you successful as a nine was that you were able to do basic things. If you were an accountant, you could put together a spreadsheet. It, you could, the numbers add, it tick tied, didn't require a lot of involvement with other people. And pretty straightforward. So most of what made you successful, 90% or so of what made you successful at the entry level was being able to do whatever your role was technically. As you progress in your career, that expectation of the organization changes. The higher you go, the more the organization expects this thing called leadership. And in that, we talk about things like being able to connect the dots, being able to work with people, being able to uh, have influence, being able to establish effective relationships, being able to see around corners, being able to get people to do things. This is, so this becomes increasingly important. By the time you become a senior executive, then 70% or more of your 
of what makes you successful is your ability to get these soft things done. And rarely do senior people ever get in trouble over the technical. When they get in trouble, it's they get in trouble because they are unable to um, work these softer issues. So the code that I, I like to think of when we're hiring, I'm hiring a 13 or a 14, 15 or SES. The question I think I have in mind is, does he get it? Does she get it? Does she understand that she's no longer a technician? but now as a leader. But, but so, what does that really look like, Clarence? I mean, come on, you, you, you and I both came up through the ranks. You know, we were all, we, we started out as a GS2 and worked our way up. But by the time you get to that 13 technical, you are so proficient and you've gotten all of the accolades because you have been so technically proficient. But when you start to walk into that 14, that 15, into that SES, and you're dealing with other people's money, okay? Yes. The technical part really isn't going to carry you through at that level. It's really the leadership making sure that you have a keen and solid understanding of the mission and yes. the operations of what you were trying to find the dollars for. And yes. that's a hard adjustment and that's a hard transition. I know it was for me when I stepped out of the Department of Defense and then walked into NASA, I had been technically competent at DOD. I was very well versed in the accounting and we had 18 different accounting systems. And of course they still can't get a financial audit, but don't hold that against me. But <laughs> hey, you know, I, I never said I was a great CFO. And you said early on, we were in the bad, in the bad group. So we're careful about what we do. But walking into NASA as a senior leader and having to make that transition was very difficult for me. Um, I will be honest with you. And it is a personal and professional growth for anyone trying to make that, that, that growth change from technical to leadership, because you have to learn a new language. You have to be able to ascribe the resources to the mission and operations. And you have to be technically proficient in what the organization does rather than the debits and the credits and the proprietary and the budgetary information. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the jobs get so demanding that you no longer have the ability to do everything yourself. Before, in your earlier grades, when you were technically competent, you had the skills and the ability, you could do all of the stuff yourself. Now at the more senior levels, um, you become increasingly dependent upon people in other parts of the organization. When think about it, the times uh, in, in where you are today and when you were, and when we were CFOs together, that so much of what made us successful was being able to get people in other organizations, people that didn't report to us, people who had their own priorities, but figuring out how to work with them to do what we needed to do. You know, think about OMB. So we were, you were at NASA, I was at OPM, but to get where we needed to go and to get our organizations where we needed to go, we had to figure out how to work with OMB. They had their own priorities, they had their own issues, and then working with the Hill. So. The jobs just require so much more that you just can't do it all yourself. And it's beyond even your organization. You have to be able to figure out how to create these relationships and to get people to do things because they're just as busy as you are and they have as many priorities and concerns as you have. Why should they stop and help you? Well, there is a person on the call today that has already identified themselves to me, and I, <clears throat> I didn't even remember the story, so thank you for that person, and I will not call you out, said person on the call. However, relationships, as you were speaking to, are very, very tantamount and important. Uh, in my current role, we had a, a, an issue where we needed resources, and reprogramming in a funding opportunity is always one of those great 
op uh, great opportunities where you are able to look at other people's resources, particularly if you're in a big organization like DHS. And I did have that opportunity to kind of snoop around at my counterparts. <laughs> and because, um, you know, that's me being the spanky budgeteer. OK, yeah. I know my budget, but I also take a peek at other people's money, pots of money, too. Yes. And the most I'm going to tell everybody, here's one of the secrets to my sauce on budget. OK, always know your own dollars and how you're executing, because it's out there on the public domain in order to know how other agencies are executing. And then if you're in a big department, take a look at some of the big dogs in your department and see how they're executing. And if they have some lever or some measure of where they're not executing, then you start squeaking like a squeaky wheel in order to help them execute at a higher level. I felt I was helping them. Okay, of course, I'm sure the person on the call who I still owe a lunch to, by the way, so I, now that you're retired, I can take you to lunch. <laughs> um, I was able to successfully in the leadership role, make it a DHS issue, an opportunity for the Secret Service to get some additional resources in order to mitigate an operational dilemma that we had at that point in time. And we partnered with one of the other uh, agencies within DHS. Now, um, he did remind me prior to this starting out that I still owe A, owe him lunch, and owe two, I owe him those dollars that we reprogrammed. So, but <laughs> again, back to the relationship, back to a little opportunity of the secret sauce, know your own budget, but also peek around your neighborhood to see who else may have some change hanging around. Absolutely, absolutely. So they might be able to help you today. You might be in a position to help them tomorrow. Or take them to lunch. Or take them to lunch. Well, probably <laughs> take them to lunch, but never do. <laughs> <laughs> so a lesson learned is if someone says, I'm going to help you spend your money, and as a result, I'm going to take you to lunch, my advice is get right. them to take you to lunch first. Mm -hmm. That way you make sure. But no. So, but, but again, as this role and understanding your role and understanding that at the higher levels, that this, that the, the assignments are so big that it's too big for you to be able to do alone. And the, the jobs are so demanding that it requires that you be able to work across organizational lines, um, working with others in other parts of the department, maybe OMB, the Hill, and sometimes stakeholders, uh, outside stakeholders, to to be able to get things done. And that's what's expected. So as you grow, one of the tests for you to do is from time to time, take a snapshot. How are you spending your time? If you're grade 15 and you're still spending 70, 80% of your time technical, then I think you're spending your time incorrectly. You're not meeting the expectations that the organization has for you in the, at that level. You wanna go to the next slide, Gwen? Oh, why not? What do we got else to talk about? Okay. All righty. So we're going to talk about five keys and we're going to share some insights as we go. So be with us. So know your environment. Gwen, what does that mean? Well, for knowing your environment, you need to know not only what the dollars or the resources that you're looking for, but know what you're advocating for those resources for. So for instance, the Department of Defense, I worked at the OSD Comptroller. In that realm, in that position, we had oversight over Army, Navy, Air Force, and, and um, Marines, and of course, the defense agencies, okay? While I, that is a big, huge portfolio, as Clarence said, you don't have the ability to be technical in all of those, but you also have to be able to know the environment, the political environment, that is actually um, uh, being enforced upon that entity or that agency. And what are those nuances or what are the things that Congress and the American public are advocating for when it comes to the Department of Defense? When I was at NASA, having that great opportunity, stepping into that, it was completely different frame of environment when I walked into NASA because at NASA, 
DOD is relevant, protection of our borders, protection of our civil liberties and everything else. But at NASA, we're talking space exploration. So it's a completely different environment, scientific, um, engineers, scientists, astronauts, completely different type of environment. And the request from Congress and from the American public was completely different. At that point in time at NASA, we were having an educational crisis. So recognizing that we had engineers and scientists, if there's an educational crisis, then there's going to be a pipeline of engineers, scientists, and astronauts that do not have the STEM type of education. So recognizing that, we, cha we changed and we actually made sure our budgetary resources were impactful to those things that the environment, AKA the Congress and the American public would get behind in order to fund in our quest for space exploration. And that was where we developed the moon, Mars and beyond. And they are well, well on their track to continue to do that type of exploration. And we are leaving what we call the lower earth orbit exploration to the commercial sector. And we just saw that this week with Branson making his first initial flight into space. So basically the environment at NASA was that we're gonna go further beyond the moon and we're gonna leave the exploration of the moon uh, around the earth or earth orbit to the private sector. And that is coming to fulfillment. And we developed that well over 10 years ago and it is coming to fulfillment now. So knowing your environment is very important before you start putting pen to pencil and trying to figure out where you should be advocating for your resources. Because if the American public and Congress aren't behind it, nine times out of 10, your congressional staff members and everyone else along the way on that journey to those resources won't be with you either. What do you think, Clarence? Absolutely. And knowing your environment, as Gwen said, is situational. So it depends on where you are. When I was at the Patent and Trademark Office, we were fee funded, essentially 100% fee funded. So we were funded by patent and trademark applicants. So knowing the environment not only meant understanding intellectual property, but we had to understand the economy because the economy impacted how people filed patent and trademark applications. So we were there during the time of the, of the, uh, of the dot com bubble, and there were applications and revenue just flowing from the private sector. If you remember um, around in the 2000s, early 2000s, um, the uh, dot com was just exploding, more and more dot com businesses. We were overwhelmed by applications, especially on the trademark side from from new dot-com businesses. We could barely keep up. The rate of growth was like 25% 25, uh, 25 year-over-year growth in, in applications. And then the dot-com bubble burst. And we went from 25% year-over-year growth to about 20% year-over-year decline. So being able to understand, so knowing your environment could also then, in our case, required us to understand the, um, the, the dot-com business, to understand the economy, because we, had to, we couldn't spend more money than we raised. So we had to be able to anticipate changes in the economy and how those changes would impact the filing patterns of patent and trademark applicants, because that's where our revenue was coming from. And you know, interestingly enough, Gwen, during that time was when we started to see the growth in the applications in the uh, human um, genomic area. So a lot of what we saw over the last year or so with the vaccines was predicated on what was starting to happen 20 years ago, when those first applications came in on gene sequencing and, 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 and the like, those applications at, at that time, you had to submit them electronically and you had to submit paper. Some of those applications came in in, in like 20 and 30 boxes of computer runs. And that was what laid the groundwork 
for the country right now to be able to quickly turn around these vaccines based on uh, looking at the uh, human uh, uh, genome. So you're in some exciting places. When was there at NASA laying the groundwork for what you see right now happening? So in finance, the other thing about finance is you're right in the middle of everything. Knowing this, so you need to know, you need to know, depending upon your organization, you need to know what's happening in the economy. You need to understand the, the, um, the priorities of the key members on your appropriations committee. What are their interests? How, and keep figure out how to keep them engaged and interested. Where does your program fit in the overall priorities for the administration if you're part of a department? Where, what is it? How, what's your strategy? Where do you fit with the strategy? Maybe you're involved in national security. So you would have to understand sort of how your programs impact the national security priorities of the United States of America. So you have to understand the big picture. And you've got to be able to distill this because quite often in the role of the CFO, you quite often have a, a unique perspective. You are aware of what's going on in the mission side. You spend enough time with them to understand what they're doing, but you bring a perspective where you can help them understand this environment. And the other thing I'm just gonna just, just state here, the people on the mission side, the people that were examining patents and trademarks or, or at OPM, the people that were administering the uh, the retirement programs, they're the experts in that. They have deep knowledge. They're extremely confident, great people, hardworking. But quite often they don't have that broader perspective. And we are the ones that help them shape it. Let me ask you a question, audience. How many of you actually hire people? Think about those resumes you get. How many of those resumes would you say, if you get a stack of resumes, for a position. How many of those resumes would you say are great resumes? Unless you're significantly different and you're very fortunate, probably most of the resumes you get are worthless. They look bad. I even had someone complete an application. Gwen, I had someone send in an application for an SES job and a handwritten, um, a handwritten uh, resume. Okay, who who is your HR crew? Because we don't have any problems over at Secret Service. <laughs> well, we I got it. So, uh, so my point is this to everyone: you know how bad those resumes look. Well, that's how, quite honestly, how bad some of the of the uh, resource requests coming out of the program side of the house. And if you listen to the things that we're going to offer today going to help you significantly improve the quality so that your uh, request will be packaged in such a way that it will look like that outstanding resume that you see when you're going through that package and you say, wow, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Ready to go to the next one, Gwen? I am. Okay. So we're, we're going to- That's more favorites. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll start off and then I'll, 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 one of the nice things about finance, budget and finance is that it is, the cycle is very predictable. Whether you're at uh, DHS or over at, uh, in DOD and you're using the PPBE, or you are over in commerce or department of education, there's a formulation cycle. It starts about the same time every year. So the important thing is to know the, the, the budget cycle for your agency. Why is that it's so important? Because when you know the cycle, now you know that at a certain time during the course of the year, the agency is going to be looking for big ideas for formulation, new ideas. So being able to know that now you start to prepare getting your ideas ready because you know that in your agency, they start developing the budget, let's say in January. 
So you know that. So now you start to prepare yourself. You start to talk to people. You start positioning yourself four, five, six months, maybe a year out just to begin to talk about it and to get it onto people's radar screens. But because budget is so, has these processes and these timeframes, use the budget structure and the budget process to help you. Gwen, I'll, I'll stop here and let you comment. Well, the budget formulation is what I think of as the 18 month plan. Yep. This is really your opportunity to start 18 months before you actually need the dollars to execute something that you start dreamscaping of what your vision is going to be 18 months to, from now. And in that opportunity, through in any organization that you work in, because each one has a different budget formulation internally, but I'm going to tell you, there's a couple of things that are pretty much standard, no matter what agency that you go to. So internally, there's probably 18 months prior to you get to the actual fiscal year where you're going to have to execute those dollars of lots of internal conversations. So be the squeaky wheel. I have the best idea and this is the, the amount of money that it takes. And I'm going to need this money starting on this fiscal year. And then I need dollars going all the way out. Create your full story in that budget formulation time frame. Okay. Nail down your request. And well, Gwen, be how do I know whether how do I know whether my idea is really an important idea that would help the agency? I mean, so how do how do how do, how do I know that? Well, first of all, you 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 better take your CFO and your budget officer out for a cup of coffee at Starbucks. That's a good start. Take an opportunity to network, as we said earlier on, it's about relationships. And then take the opportunity to take a look at your budget. Look at what has been enacted, enacted, good public knowledge. A lot of people don't look at it, even when you get into these leadership roles. When you, we all read the newspaper, Congress finally passed and enacted appropriations and the government can work. Everybody goes, whoo, my paycheck's going, and they stop reading, okay? I'm going to encourage all leaders and managers on this call, take a look at your portion of the enacted budget that has been passed for each fiscal year when it gets passed and see what those priorities are. And then look at what your operation is, your piece of the pie is, and then have that thought forward thinking thought process 18 months and start being that squeaky wheel inside your organization in the budget formulation opportunity. Because if you do a good job of coming to your leadership and or your CFO with a well thought out plan, just like you need a well developed resume to get uh, in the door with Clarence, then nine times out of 10, your idea will have a chance to survive versus some of your compatriots. Does that work, Clarence? Yeah, and being able to articulate why giving money to you benefits the agency. So I that always solve, use the lovely- Solve a problem. Yeah. yeah, so I always say either I'm solving a problem or I'm mitigating a risk. So yes. if you can bring that to the forefront for your leadership, if you're solving one of their big key problems or making some headway in solving one of their problems, you're going to definitely get their attention. If you can show, if you don't do this, here is the risk, be it reputational risk, operational risk, risk to the environment of the people that work in that operation, then you will also be in a position to have your internal dialogue discussion and get people's attention as you're working through that budget formulation. And I'm going to kind of walk us into the next key area, which is your congressional action. So if you've done a real good job having your elevator speech on the budget formulation for what you want 18 months in advance, when you get to that congressional action, you have to interact with the House uh, Appropriation Committee and the Senate Appropriation Committee, you're gonna be in a good stead to have your elevator speech and be able to talk about those risks and be able to talk about the benefit of what it is that you're advocating for and why those resources, given all the other challenges that we've got going on here in the, in the good United States, why this is important and just this piece of funding, 
will take care of one small problem. Clarence, over to you. Yeah. And, and so in formulation, we're looking for big ideas and, and solving big problems. In execution, I always think of execution as like finding money in the cushions of the sofa. It's smaller dollars. At the beginning of the fiscal year, you ask us, do you have any money? No, nope, we don't have a dime. Don't have a dime. You can't spend anything where money's tight. And then as you guys have seen, probably around April, May, all of a sudden we got money. And you say, how do we get money? Clarence had it in his back pocket the whole time. <laughs> That's what I used to think when I was when I was a junior person at IRS. The uh, at the start of the fiscal year, we we didn't have enough money to you know to even you know take a taxi any place. You had to walk because you could no money. And then and then by by June, we had all this money, and the CFO was a hero. And they're like, well, part of what's happening is. One of the consequences of, of CRs, it slows down spending. So if you were planning new hires and you're under a CR, so you don't, you can't hire, you were hoping to start hiring first of November, but because of the CRs and the like, everything was frozen until January. It's hard to recover. Or you were planning on having a big contract awarded in February. But because of other issues, and so the contract would be awarded in February and you'd start paying on that contract for those services in March, the rest of the year. Well, what happens is the contract doesn't get awarded in February. The contract gets awarded in April or May. And again, you can't just make up that time. So what happens, the thing I would just suggest is, irrespective of what everybody tells you, always assume that money will be available by the third quarter. And again, it's like finding coins in the sofa. So you can't spend it on to hire people because then you have to not only pay for them this year, but you got to pay for them going forward. But you use that money for uh, uh, non-recurring things. Maybe you need to buy some equipment. Maybe you need to buy a service. But when do you start to think about this? Well, for most agencies, we're getting ready to start fiscal year 22 in a few months. Most agencies will start to put together a spending plan for fiscal year 22. They're probably working on it now. They'll have it ready before 22 starts. And here's the way it works. You've seen it. You are leading, you are a special agent in ICE and you're leading a group of special agents in Los Angeles and you have 10 people and you have a million dollars, that's what you had in 21. So they start off with 22 saying, you have 10 people and a million dollars. And so you respond, tell them what you would do with that. But here's what I would suggest you also do. Let them know, if you have, if, if you can hire another couple of people, if, you know, if I can have another couple of people, if I can have another thousand dollars in training or travel money, here's what I could do for you. So again, starting to not just wait till try to get your requirements in 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 that uh, that third quarter, that April, May, uh, June time frame. Start to raise it early. Here's what I could do. If you have two dollars more, here's what I could do with it, and tie it back to helping solve a problem, or as Gwen said, to avoid a potential risk, start that conversation early. Start it within your chain. So if you are in technology, you start that conversation in technology. And you begin to work that up through the CIO shop to the people who are, are advising the CIO, or if you're in human capital, or if you are uh, leading uh, uh, enforcement removal operations at ICE, you start that conversation early and you put it in terms of how giving you an additional dollar helps you better position and, and enable the agency to carry out its mission. Gwen, you want to jump to uh, review and review audit. audit? Yeah. Review and audit is one of those rare opportunities. Not a lot of the operations or the missions really get significantly impacted by this. 
only the the only time that they get impacted is when they're actually digging into those the, um, true transactions at the uh, mission or operational level. But this is something that is normally thought of of ah, let the CFO team take care of that, and you know we don't really care about much of that. But I'm going to tell you, this is a great opportunity if you use it well. And this would be one of those other pieces of the secret sauce. Because the, o, the review and audit is normally conducted in most agencies by the Office of Inspector General. And we know that the Office of Inspector General and the General Accounting Office, GAO, get a lot of attention when it comes to the news, as well as Congress. And so if there are any interesting or unique or mission or operational opportunities that somehow need to be addressed and haven't gotten a platform or a forum, sometimes if you can make the unique connection, they can be brought up, <coughs> excuse me, brought up in the audit or the review and they can be put as comments or you can ask the auditor that says, hey, you know, we've been doing a lot of this international space travel and the impact on the astronauts and their welfare, given the time that they're up there, most of the time, the astronauts have been going back and forth in a very short period of time. And here's the cost, and here's how we've been able to delineate that. And yes, we've done a really good job of tracking that, but what we haven't done is figured out what the cost would be if we had them up there for a longer period of time, and then what would be the ancillary cost associated with the care and upkeep of those astronauts health-wise due to the impact of gravity on their bodies. So we were just having a interesting conversation with their auditors about that. Not that it has any rat thing to do with the financial statements, but because they were intrigued and I got them interested in it, it ended up being as part of some of their comments in the financial audit. Absolutely. And the next thing I know, Congress is wanting to speak to the director and everyone else about space travel and the impact on the human body. And, you know, it was just, a little piece of the secret sauce of using something that was at my disposal to initiate a conversation. Absolutely. Just a thought. Hmm. Right. We're going to jump to the next area, relationships. Hmm. And uh, we have a couple of slides we're going to use for this one. But this is a relationship business. The key decision makers and the people that support the key decision makers at your agency, at the department level, at OMB, and the appropriation staff are career people who are around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the thing to think about is nobody gives anybody any money to anybody that they don't know. It's just that happen. Ain't gonna just give you money. So having that relationship and figuring out who are those critical people, how do you build those relationships? I wanna go over a couple of slides and then we're gonna talk about that. The first thing I just wanna share with you is a tool that we've used. We call it a relationship chart. And you know, in your roles, you say, I've gotta, I've gotta reach out to so-and-so, another part of the organization. And, and you know, it's Sunday evening, you got your list of things you're gonna do for the week. You know, I'm gonna to talk to Sean, I'm gonna to talk to so-and-so. These people are critical to what I need to get done. I need to keep a relationship with them. And then before you even get into the office on Monday, the whole thing is blown up. All of your plans have been destroyed. You're running around like crazy and it's now six o'clock on Friday evening and you haven't spoken to a soul. Well, one of the things that we started doing was just putting together, identifying who are those critical relationships. So, so if you are 
in the uh, NASA area where Gwen is, and and you're in in and let's say in the in the manned space uh, flight area, then part of those relationships might be people that are involved in that part of the business. Could be people in the human capital area. Maybe you have to do some special hiring um, at OPM. Maybe they are people at OMB. Maybe they're people on the Hill. Maybe they're people in industry. Who are the 10 to 15 critical people that you need to develop a relationship with that have will have influence over your ability to get your work done? So here, the chart down the left-hand column is the list of individuals. And then across the top are bye weeks. We found that just staying in touch with people every couple of weeks. And don't count just formal meetings, but these would be times where maybe you just stop in and just say, hey, what's going on? Can I, you know, how are things going? I'm gonna show you a video, then we're gonna stop and, and talk about it. Networking, in my opinion, is a point-to-point -point relationship where reciprocity is almost guaranteed or expected. Individuals who generally do well in networking venues are mostly transactional businesses because they need something immediately and that need is satisfied immediately. Net weaving is a different concept because it really focuses on longer life cycle that's centered on relationship building as opposed to immediate gratification or reciprocity. The net weaving concept is designed for really service-based long cycle businesses where the cultivation of relationships are the most important thing. A net weaver has the understanding that they really are looking at their client's needs first. And in creating a service wall of individuals who provide services outside of their core competence, and they want to become more of a resource to their client. So, Gwen, We've been talking about relationships. Let me ask you a question. Does that mean that from time to time, you're gonna to have to develop relationships with people that have different points of view than you? Well, <clears throat> I, I look at it a little differently than okay. you. Okay. That, that's the reason why I was always in the bad group. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. See, what I, what I look at it is, is, it's not that they have a different point of view than I do. Uh-huh. It's just that they haven't been cultivated to the point of view where I'm at in order to enhance their opportunity. I see. I see. So you're going yeah. to help them see the light. I didn't say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I said I was going to enhance their opportunity. Well, wait, 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 I'm going to ask you another question. I'm going to ask you another question about this relationship stuff. Does that mean I got to even, how about, do I have to sometimes put on that list people I don't like? I mean, I'm just, just asking. So honey, you know, on, huh? on the top five are definitely the people that, that you don't like and that you know don't like you. Yes. So I got to, I got to, sometimes I'm going to have to have, a, I'm going to have to figure out how to develop a relationship with people I don't like and people that don't like me. Exactly. Because therein lies an opportunity for them to overcome the challenge that they personally have in the moment. And the reason why they don't like you because they don't know how wonderful you are. Because I think, me personally, I am just absolutely a charming person. And I'm very much likable if you just meet me on my terms. And you do what you say. I did not say that. You uh, said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> but honestly, I mean, I know we're joking around, but truly, when it comes to net weaving, even the most challenging individuals, even the most um people that you just you know you just uh when you walk into the room if you take the time to engage and do some net weaving find out what it is that makes them tick and sometimes it breaks down those walls because you never know in the midst of a tragedy in the midst of an opportunity that person may be the key for you getting those resources or that opportunity to broach a conversation about those resources in order to make something happen. And I have found through adversity 
and through challenging individuals that they have become because of the mutual understanding that we have worked together on my biggest and my best allies. So net weaving relationship building is something at the leadership management level that I cannot stress enough, particularly when you're going after other people's money. So you've got to figure out how to make these relationships work to benefit your organization. And I, and Gwen is absolutely correct. Quite often it's right there in the middle of an adversity. I was in a staff meeting one time and one of my colleagues was being um, challenged by the head of the agency over an issue. And I just stopped the head of the agency and said, it, it's not his fault, it's mine. You know, we screwed it up. It just happened to fall apart on his watch. So the head of the agency was unhappy, said a couple of things to me. But, you know, as we were walking out that door, Gwen, this person looked at me and said, in all my years in the government, nobody has ever done it for me before. Mm -hmm. Accountability in a relationship is key. And owning your stuff. Yes. is very, very important. And that builds a long-term relationship that goes well beyond where your job is now. Because I know with the 91 some individuals that are on this call, not everyone is going to start at one entity and stay there. They're going to shift. They're going to move. They're going to do other things. And you just never know who you're going to encounter as you're going through that journey called government um, careers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we'll continue. And um, the next area is we're going to look at data. I'm just going to say just a word about it, then we'll go into the video. Kip Gwen, if, if you talk to the average federal employee and you say, do you have a role in the budget? They say, no, I ain't got no role in the budget. You know, I run, I run uh, payroll, I run uh, hiring, I'm, you know, I'm the uh, architect, the, uh, the uh, systems architect, you know, I'm a special agent leading this group or whatever. The reality is, it is the result of your work is the basis for your agency getting money. Because what you have to demonstrate is your agency. Go listen to the appropriation hearings for your agency. When it's going well, they're talking about how well the organization is doing. How well are we treating um, veterans uh, at the VA hospitals? All of those kind of things. So it comes down to results. And we're going to talk here and we're going to run this video for you to just take a look at moving your data and your results to a new level, not just having spreadsheets with tabular data. Look at this. Welcome to the Agencia Business Travel Academy. What is data visualization? Data is a hot topic. People buy and wear a t-shirt saying data nerd or data is the new bacon. True story, you can check it out online. With the digitalization era, data went from scarce, expensive, difficult to find and collect to abundant and cheap very difficult to process and understand. That's when the concept of big data emerged. Incredible amounts of information, so vast that they were challenging to capture, store, understand, and analyze with traditional software. However, all of this material is only as good as what we can make out of it, as individuals and businesses. Terabytes of data sitting in a data center unused is a burden. If correctly processed, it can become digital gold. Big data is often combined with machine learning to create predictive analytics or other analytics processes that bring the value of the information to light. Still, if you do not own a PhD in data science, the raw details can remain obscure. That's where data visualization comes into play. Data visualization is the process of taking raw data, transforming it into graphs, charts, images, and even videos that explain the numbers and allow us to gain insights from it changes the way we make sense of the information to create value out of it. Discover new patterns and spot trends. Think about a simple example. How do you create a story to tell your boss out of thousands of rows of data in an Excel spreadsheet? 
an easy way is to create a chart, like a pie or a bar chart, of that same data. Now you have a visual representation and can start analyzing and integrating it into your business, giving meaning and purpose to the original raw data. In the business travel industry, data visualization truly empowers travel managers and reporting users by providing clear and actionable insights into their programs. A data-driven program brings value to all stakeholders, from the finance controller to the security manager and the HR manager to travelers themselves. It allows for better control and prediction of travel spend and increases traveler security and satisfaction. Imagine if you could get a visual representation of your past, current, and future travel spend to show to your CFO, or if you could visualize the impacts of each change you make to your travel policies or negotiated rates. What about if you could see where your travelers are frequently disrupted and what would be better alternatives? The possibilities are endless and data visualization can keep you ahead. This was a crash course on what is data visualization. See you in the next episode. Of so Gwen, what do you think about this visualization stuff? Is this, is this any good or not? You, you finding it to be any good? Um, yes, um, it is very good from the perspective that we have lots of data <clears throat> now in the financial area and we have lots of data as it relates to our operations and our emissions because that kind of started with the CFO Act from 1990. So recognizing that we have all this data, now it's really a good opportunity for leaders and managers and organizations to take that opportunity to partner with the financial folks and come up with those results that we have as we move forward. Recognizing that, NASA had the opportunity, you can go out there on the website now and look at what they call NASA hits, okay? And literally they took things that they were doing on the operational realm from making Tang to the enhancements with technology as it relates to uh, satellites and the performance of satellites and being able to do GPS here on earth to uh, food preservation because of everything that we learned about trying to feed the astronauts in space and using all those things and came up with said, here's the dollars that we invested in all these things in order to do the mission and the operations of NASA. And here's all the hits and the benefits, the attributes that have just been spread throughout the United States and the technology transfer that has happened that we're able to share. And being able to provide a clear and solid results for your organization for the investment that the American public has made with those tax dollars is absolutely, absolutely critical. And I did see that there was a question for us, Clarence. So do you mind if I take it? Please, and, absolutely, absolutely. Because we don't want to leave the questions un, unheard here. So there's a question from one of my friends that I still deserve lunch to, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he says, how do you gain insight and lessons learned on outstanding budget, budget proposals that were not approved so you can reshape and resubmit in the future? I will take a stab at that because we and all of my budget incarnations, just because you tried one time doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. You keep it on the board. So one of the tricks of the trade or the secret sauce that you would come up with is those unfunded requirements, UFR, unfunded requirements, okay? It is a requirement for us to be able to do X, Y, and Z, and we have not been able to garner support to do this. And you keep extolling the risk if this doesn't happen in proportion to everything else that you're trying to get funded within your organization. Then you also have the opportunity in many forms, both based uh, uh, out of OMB, Office of Management and Budget, they sometimes request, what are your over guidance? Meaning here's the amount of money that we gave you and here's all the things that you can fund in there. And then you provide them with a list of over guidance opportunities. So if some more dollars shake out of that cushion in the couch, you are in well solid position with your over guidance. And you can say, and we've been asking for this for X years, five years, whatever. And the risk just keeps getting uh, worse as we go along. So, and that's what I would do sometimes is being that squeaky wheel. 
And then sometimes if you just don't get that attention, uh, remember that other little secret sauce I gave you on the review and audit? That would be another opportunity where you might want to contemplate a strategy to put there. So, you know, in my little toolkit, my little bit, in my little um, <clears throat> bad CFO bag, I, uh, I have all sorts of opportunities to get a form because truly it's about networking, communication, and getting your request and your requirement on the table so it can have a, dis a good, clean discussion. Does that work, Clarence? Absolutely, absolutely. So, and I would just say that if you haven't started to use some of these business analytic tools to help explain and to show the relationships and the like, you need to. Virtually every agency has these tools available on your, uh, on your system uh, to be able to do some of the basic things being able to present basic information. If you have people in your organization that are competent with Excel, they can pick these tools up and produce some basic runs probably within a few weeks. And Clarence, I think somebody out here, I'm going, I, I really do need, we're going to have to take them to lunch. I'm going to let you go with us and you can pay for lunch because this is the lunch that I still owe the individual, but he's doing you a solid. He says data, a lot of data but need to continuously validate the purpose, need, and use if gaps address, e.g. outcomes and benefits. Data without a story is just numbers. Yeah. So I think he'd have read your charts because that's where you're yes. headed next. That's where we're headed next. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk, look here at story. So look at this as sort of how does the story tie into this? Take a look at this video. Everyone loves a good story, whether it's a tear-jerking movie, drama unfolding in a soap opera, or a riveting page-turner. We humans become completely captivated by good stories. For most of human history, information has been shared in the form of stories. Our brains are programmed more for stories than they are for abstract ideas or facts. A good story helps people interpret the facts and see a bigger picture. And if you're the one telling the story, you can influence the way your audience interpret facts. This means storytelling offers distinct advantages over other types of communication. Firstly, stories can reach all types of people and employees, regardless of age or educational background. In addition, stories help people remember facts. So much so, cognitive psychologist Jerome Bruner claims that a fact wrapped in a story is 22 times more memorable than the fact told in isolation. Finally, stories can reach all types of learners. Neil Fleming's VARC model suggests there are three key types of learners. Visual learners, auditory learners and kinetic learners. Stories get through to all three types. The emotion and feelings of stories connect with kinetic learners, a story's imagery influences visual learners, and the vocabulary appeals to auditory learners. So with stories, the, the thing that, that I would just say to kick it off is, the more senior the people, the more they love the stories. Once they're comfortable with your numbers, they're comfortable with your accomplishments, the stories are what bring, as the, as the uh, uh, person that Gwen read uh, had mentioned, the stories are what bring the numbers and everything to life. And so if you get an opportunity to brief your agency head, you get a chance to talk to senior people at OMB or on the Hill, they love stories. Now, for those of us that have children and young had young children, uh, you know, you had to tell your child, you know, Goldilocks uh, every evening. And now, you know, that's nice. Kids, would, you could tell them the same story every time you saw them for a month and they would just be excited about it. Well, with these folks here, they don't want to hear the same story every time. When they see you, they want, tell me a new story. And that's where you come in because in many instances, you are the subject matter experts. So we've got the data and we got the arguments to why we should do this or that. But then Gwen or myself would turn to you and you would say, I run human 
flight exploration for NASA. And let me tell you why. I run um, the uh, ICE uh, uh, enforcement uh, um, activity. Let me tell you what I see. That is so, so very powerful. They'll remember that. They'll repeat that story to each other over and over again. Gwen. And not only do they like stories, <clears throat> they like funny stories, okay? Yeah. It doesn't actually have to be a story that relates to um, the operation and or the mission, but it could be a unique find or a unique circumstance. I mean, even from myself with regards to the financial audit, and we needed additional dollars in order to implement what we call internal controls. And I'm going to have to get the nice folks on the Hill to invest $2 million for internal controls, which is literally just looking at the processes of how I execute the dollars. That's not exciting compared to space technology and space uh, exploration and launching astronauts. But an interesting story that stuck with them and why it was important was because during one of the audits that I had, we had to figure out how we were going to uh, account for a rack that was on a space shuttle. So let me explain what a rack is on a space shuttle. There's a lot of stuff that we shove into the shuttle then that we were flying back and forth to the International Space Station. But there were some things that were just a little bit too big that we could not put into the shuttle and launch we literally had to put them on the backside of the air shuttle and we had to attach it like a rack, almost like a Honda or any of your cars when you put stuff on the back of your rack. Now the fun part was, and the interesting part of the story was that we had to get this rack from Italy. It was not something that we could build here in the United States because of the type of metal and the type of uh, construction and the unique design because it was for space exploration. So it's not like you could go to uh, Nissan and ask them for a rack to put on the back of a shuttle. And literally we would tell the story of that nature. But internal controls, because we had to get a piece of property from Italy, be able to properly price it between the Italians and ourselves because there's nobody else that's going to use this rack but us on our shuttle. And so there wasn't any comparable value and trying to walk the auditors through that. So if there's any auditors on here, please don't be offended. But you know, they always wanted to have a comparable. And so we were able to kind of tell the story and then being able to show a picture of the actual rack. That was just one of those stories that stuck with the appropriators. And I got my $2 million in order to do the internal controls review there at NASA. But stories have an impact, particularly if you can anchor them on those resources that you're trying to uh, obtain. Absolutely, absolutely. And then of course, if it's new, sexy, and something they'd never see and, and have an opportunity to share the story someplace else. So keep the story simple too. Yeah. So I think at this point, we're open now for additional questions what? and answers. Get to the first slide. And uh, we're happy to take any questions and answers. You can put them in the chat or you can, I guess if they can, you can unmute and ask if you would like. Hi, Gwen and um, Clarence. I, this is V Chong from um, Custom and Border Protection. Um, I, I personally um, have worked on audit, internal control financial reporting and I'm new to the budgetary realm. Um, I just started a position um, in February, just learning the budget world. I, I think you, you, you've been in the CFO office, so you know that budgeting is quite different than uh, the financial accounting aspect. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning the process and trying to understand it. Um, but you, you talk about, uh, building relationships um, as you move further into your career, 14, 15 level. Um, what I see from an operational side of budget is that um, because CPP is such a large agency within the Department of Homeland, we are given sort of buckets of, of funding 
for different purposes within custom and border protection. We we have obviously the the border to uh, to protect, but then all of the trade transactions, all of the things that come into the United States have to go through CBP as well. So you know most people don't know that CBP is the second. Um, uh, the second col uh, second collection agency behind the IRS. Um, so we there's a lot of transaction going on, but from a from a budgetary perspective, I guess you know I was inspired by you um, talking about how you look at other people's budget and try to find areas to. Um, the, the word exploit is a little strong, but but to I be partner, able to I partner <laughs> to partner, yes, to, to partner and find ways to utilize the funding. I feel um, at, at least from what I, I hear at the year at year end, some sometimes some um, department or organization within uh, CBP um, are very protective of their funding during the year, but then at the three day or the five day before the book close, that's when they realize, oh, I cannot use the remaining money. And so I'm going to find a way to dump it somewhere. So I don't look bad that I didn't obligate my funding. And obviously this is a poor behavior, right? Because we're, we're we're not planning appropriately to execute. Um, but I, I feel like with CRs, multiple CRs in a year, it makes it so difficult for an organization to plan ahead with procurement. Um, and you know, the, the, the procurement process is, is lengthy. And so how do, what do you see or suggest Congress to improve the budgetary process in that so that we don't waste money more towards the end of the year, how can we execute better in a CR environment? Um, I guess from um, from the FAA perspective, I, I, I think I saw that when when we go into a shutdown, their their employees are, are not going to be uh, mm -hmm. furlough any anymore. So that is one good thing that I've seen. This, this past year via the news, but um, in terms of other agency, I haven't seen anything more to that, but what, what do you see as, as a, a change that would make budgetary process more efficient given the CR situation that we're in? Well, first I would say, <clears throat> get us out of the CR situation. Um, Congress says that intentionally, honestly, in order to reduce the amount of dollars that are out there, uh, in order to manage the top line of the overall government's budget and deficit. Okay, so that's a strategy that Congress is using in order to pull on levers, in order to keep the federal monolith called the federal spending in somewhat check. So that's what they're doing there. So CRs are impactful in the fact that, as you did say, it requires some nimbleness by on the, on the part of the agencies, particularly you at CBP, and trying to hire and meet your mission, et cetera. But you can, I'm already planning for a CR in my organization. So you can already say, what would happen to me and do scenario planning that says, what would, what would a 30 day CR or a 60 or 90 or 120 day CR look like? I am also planning for a government shutdown. What happens if they reach a deadlock and they can't make a decision what resources will I have to operate in order to make sure that I can still meet my mission and my operations? And what things do I need to proffer quickly to OMB and to the Hill that says, if you guys don't make a decision, it's going to have a huge risk impact. And they already know that when they go to a, and to a government shutdown, because that's really the ultimate, um, uh, dancing of the elephants is Clarence and I have a chart that we call the dancing of the elephant. You know, the two elephants are stomping and dancing and fighting very hard, but it's only the grass that gets hurt. And that would be what happens to all of our agencies as the fallout is concerned. 
There has been a lot of discussion um, in government news and government forums and government magazines with regards to potentially moving towards a two year budget time frame. Because as you pointed out, the procurement and the FAR regulations in order to expend these resources are so laborious that they take anywhere from six to eight to nine months. And if you're in a CR for at least five months of that, of that year, it's very difficult. So potentially having a two-year budgetary execution timeframe rather than the one year that we are currently on has been floated concept, but I'm not quite sure that it has actually gained any traction. But definitely I understand the challenges that we encounter both on the execution side and definitely on the budgetary side. But um, the only thing I can tell you is plan like you're gonna have a CR, plan like you're gonna have a government shutdown because if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, okay? Clarence? And I would agree and I just think that being very pragmatic, CRs are a way of life. I don't see any any significant movement that's going to change that. So figuring out, and that's part of the challenge of being a, a financial professional is helping your agency figure out how to still get things done when you have CRs, when you have government shutdowns, when major initiatives are being, multi-year initiatives are being funded one year at a time how do you then help the organization figure out a way to go forward? And that's, that's, what, that's part of what your responsibility as, as uh, the financial professional is to help them figure it out. It'd be great if Congress would behave differently. I don't see it. And um, so that I, you pointed out a very challenging situation, but I don't see I don't see any, any legislative relief anytime soon. So it's up to us then to try to help the organization figure out how to overcome these challenges. Looks like we do have one question in the chat that came up um, from a Nikki Swatford. Do you wanna go ahead and read that for us, moderator? Yes, of course. Thank you, Gwen. So Nikki says, when you're building the relationships you need to succeed in the budget strategy, can you talk a little about the balance of persistence versus annoyance? For example, getting on the calendar of a busy person who may who maybe doesn't see your priorities as their priorities, and what strategies you employ to get that first meeting? I would say that when you are building these relationships, you start with understanding the other person's challenges. So the conversation starts with, tell me what you do and how I can help you. And that's the best way I have found to start these relationships. So you don't go in talking about what you need. You go in to better understand what they do and then figure out how you are in a position to help them. And what typically happens is once you've started to have that conversation and, and people start to talk, most people will then reciprocate. They'll then turn and say, well, Gwen, what is it that you do? And then how what I do would help you be successful. So you start the conversation with understanding what they do understanding the challenges that they face and figuring out how you can perhaps help them get their jobs done first. And, and, that's, and, and that's how you start the conversation. And then let it flow then to what your needs are. Again, these are long-term relationships. This is not something you're just doing for, for a month or so. This is a relationship that a lot of these relationships that Gwen has that I've had have, are in some cases are decades old. So these are relationships of people that are going to be around for a long time. Um, you may see them get even if if you were at if you are over at Treasury today. In five years from now, who knows? Uh, both of you may be at NASA. So these are long-term relationships. Start it that way be of assistance to them. 
and yeah. then have them then and let them then figure out how they can help you. Gwen. And also, I would like to change your thought process, too, because you use two terms, which I find interesting. I like one word, but I'm not familiar with the other one. Persistence versus annoyance. OK, I am persistent because I have a mission or an idea or an opportunity that just should not be passed up. So I'm going to be very persistent about what I do and how I engage and how I get an opportunity to inform leadership. I'm going to be very creative to get my thought process on the table so that people will have to hear it and consider it. So I'm very persistent, but I'm never annoying. Okay, that would be how you would deem yourself when you're you're bumping up against that wall and you think that because nobody's listening, you're annoying. It's just you haven't reached the right person or the right table in order to get the attention that it likely needs and or deserves. So I would ask you to reframe yourself a little bit and think of it as persistence, because if it's important enough for you to put money to it and for you to identify the risk, and you know that it is truly a challenge and you are coming to the table to solve something, then one needs to be persistent, okay? Because nine times out of 10, in many of the quote unquote tragedies that I've experienced in my government career from 9-11 to Columbia not coming back, it was because somebody didn't get an opportunity to say, hey, wait a minute, this is a problem and somebody needs to listen to me. So if you're not very good about the small things, when are you going to be persistent about the real critical things that may have life and property and people endangerment, okay? So as a government employee, I want you to be persistent. And I don't believe you will ever be annoying if, if what your intention of what you're doing is the right thing. And rarely do any of these new ideas catch the first time. Exactly. So it will take you maybe two or three budget cycles to get a new idea through. So it's, and that we talked about that before, being persistent. Beautiful. And we have two questions um, that came in that are quite similar. So I'll just summarize them. So for folks that are beginning to strengthen their knowledge of federal budgeting or getting more exposure to budget activities in a non-budgetary or non-supervisory non role, uh, what recommendations or resources uh, could you share to support their budget journey and process? Ooh, I'm gonna turn that over to you, Sarah. <laughs> I think to me, it's, it's one, if you're, if, you're, if you're at the beginning of your career, then building out your technical expertise, understanding you're a, you're a budget analyst and understanding the law, understanding the regulation, understanding the process, understanding how things work. That is absolutely critical because you've got to be able to demonstrate in your early days in your career that you have mastered that, whether you're a budget person or whether you're in financial management, you have to be able to demonstrate that basic competence. As you begin to grow though, is where it's incumbent upon you to broaden your scope to begin to take in to not just the technical aspects of the job. I think sometimes we have people that I've talked to who said, I've come into the job, I'm technically confident, I've got certifications, but people are coming in and getting promoted over me. Sometimes it's because we have mistakenly believed that the things that made us successful at a nine are gonna be the same kind of things that are gonna make us successful as a 13 or 14. So as the role changes, you pick up these other responsibilities. And the way I would look at it is as you grow in your role, you have to become bilingual. If you're a budget analyst, you have to understand the budget. But now as you're a 13 or a 14, you need to now become bilingual because now you need to be able to speak as intelligently about those factors in that leadership area 
as you did about the technical budget. And you have to be able to understand those areas just as well as you understood budget and continue to grow and expand and think about your career. So you have to continue to push yourself. You will push yourself into areas where you feel uncomfortable, where you there's some discomfort and, and the like, but that's for everybody. Nobody comes into this 100%. So there's a level of discomfort that each of us experiences as we continue to grow. And a lot of it is what we call the OJT, on the job training. And throughout this conversation, I have pointed you to take an opportunity, again, public knowledge, the enacted appropriations every year for all federal agencies. You can go online to um, the Hill, pull up the FY 2021 enacted, type in search, and type in your agency and it'll provide you with the whole thing. Sometimes it's a little hard to read, but take an opportunity to say, hey, someone in the budget shop and in in, in your CFO team and your organization, can you take me to lunch? Because I don't understand these words and what does this mean and how did this actually get enacted? Another opportunity is looking at Office of Management and Budget, OMB.gov. They have the A11, which is the a circular A11, which tells you everything about execution and A123, which tells you everything about internal controls and financial management. Those two give you really the, the discourse about the budget formulation and the execution process. And that's the Bible that OMB uses. That's a lot of self-learning, but it, it's an opportunity to get some exposure to the lingo and the language that is spoke about budget. And then the most foremost is I'm always, always taking people into my organization that have nothing to do with financial management, nothing to do with accounting and our budgeting. And I'm bringing them into my organization so they get an opportunity to have some developmental assignment or some exposure to that. So when they go back to the mission, they go back to the operation they have an insight on how to communicate their requirements back to me so that I can do a really good job of selling that down the street in order to get the resources that we need to meet those challenges. So there are great opportunities. I would, I know I get a lot of people that say, oh, I don't do numbers. I don't do accounting. I'm bad at math. It's really not about that. It truly is in order in the federal government, in order to do what you need to do, from a non-manager, non-financial manager's perspective, you need resources. So you need to take the opportunity to learn the lingo, learn how to make that requirement and that request, and know the process in order to get that done. Because um, as we say in relationships, um, romance with no finance becomes a nuisance. Okay, And the same applies to the federal government. If you don't have any resources, nine times out of 10, your program is not going to survive. So, so. I think the other thing I would just say, just in general, is just be curious. Mm -hmm. Every day you should try to learn something new. You should constantly be learning new things. So maybe it's reading books, read a book a, a month or so, uh, attend a conference, um, listen to a podcast, uh, some of it may be finance related. Some of it may be leadership. It may be issues around how to do a better job of uh, developing good habits or, or thinking clearly or communicating. Every day, you should try to improve a little bit every day. So it's being curious, looking, listening, thinking, being engaged will make a tremendous difference. It makes a difference over, will make a difference over a lifetime when you look back. The people who've been curious, I, I suspect if I had known Gwen in the early days, I was seeing a young lady who was curious, asking questions, looking, wondering. She's continued to do that throughout her career. Look where she is today. And I would argue that when you look at a lot of the most successful people, those are people who remain curious throughout their work lives, always wondering about this, reading about that, 
and thinking. So being curious, I think, is also incredibly important. Well said. Thank you so much, Clarence and Gwen. Um, while we wait for uh, maybe one more question, if any anyone would like to jump in, uh, we just want to quickly share just our gratitude to you both for your words of wisdom just now, and also just for a robust and fun discussion today on the five key ingredients to a strong federal budget strategy. Um, thank you to everyone for joining in and listening to our two rock stars over here. We still have some time left about uh, four minutes, we want to honor your time as well. So we'll just say for one, if not, um, just wanted to do a quick reminder and plug that we'll be posting the recording of the session in addition to related resources. Gwen, uh, Clarence, if you have any for us, uh, I'll be happy to share that with folks on our website at key.american.edu. And until then, I just want to say thank you. Um, and we'll save the last three minutes um, for anyone who wants to unmute. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time today. Bye-bye. All right, thank you. Hey, we did it, Clarence. See? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Gwen. It's always a pleasure working <laughs> with you. <laughs> and, and now I have to go back to my favorite sport, picking other people's pocket at the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> you've gotten good at that. <laughs> it is a skill, uh, it, is, it is a persistent skill that I have yes. taken the yeah. opportunity to finesse. How's that? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I enjoyed your time, my time with you, my dear. And as always, looking forward to more opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for dialing in. We're yes, please stay safe out there. Okay.